Hi, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm very glad to introduce uh, Professor Geeta Johar. Um, Geeta is a long-term friend of our, in our Department of Marketing out here. And uh, currently, she's the IAS fellow. She obtained her MBA from Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, in 1985, and a PhD from New York University, PhD in marketing from New York University in 1993. And uh, she joined Columbia Business School in 1992 and is currently the Mayor Felberg Professor of Business and also the Chair of Faculty Steering Committee for Columbia Global Centers in India. <coughs> Professor Johar's expertise lies in consumer psychology, focusing on how consumers react to some of the marketing efforts, especially advertising, promotions, and uh, sponsorship. She also examines the influence of consumer and self-control and perceptions um, of control on decision-making and consumption. She has uh, published several influential articles in the area of consumer persuasion and uh, information processing in some of the leading marketing and psychology journals. Uh, she was the associate editor for Journal of Marketing Research in 2009 to 2012, and co-editor of the Journal of Consumer Research in 2014 to 17. And I believe currently she is also an area editor in the Journal of Marketing. Here is Gita. Thanks. <laughs> sure you needed to read out those years. It makes me feel very old. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for coming, everyone. I'm very excited to uh, talk with you about this research program that I started about two years ago, uh, just before the 2016 um, election, around the time of uh, actually the campaigning for the election when this whole uh, topic of fake news was very much in the air. And the questions that people were raising were, you know, are people playing with our minds and who are these people and why are they doing this and so on. And those questions, if anything, have become even more important as we've realized that there is some uh, form of intentional manipulation that could be going on to change uh, people's um, uh, views of reality. The term uh, fake news itself, I think, has been uh, misappropriated often. So when I say fake news, I talk about um, false information that may be sensationalized and shared widely, but it's objectively false. The term has also been misappropriated to mean in any news you don't like. I'm not talking about fake news as news you don't like. I'm talking about fake news that's news that's objectively, verifiably false. Okay. So with that, let me jump straight in. I'm going to present a big program which includes like seven different papers, each of which has multiple studies. So I've kind of drawn some studies from each of these papers to talk with you about. Uh, feel free to jump in if you have uh, clarification questions. The topic, I think, also is very open to more philosophical debates. Maybe we can hold those off to the end, and you can just jump in with any clarification or uh, uh, comments about the studies and results as we proceed. Um, this work wouldn't be possible without a number of people. I always remember Hillary Clinton's It Takes a Village, and I think in this case it really takes a village, and I'm still uh, doing research on this topic with many new collaborators, everyone who comes together, not just from marketing, but from also different fields, because they care about this topic, and they care about trying to make a difference and trying to make sure that uh, the um, citizens are well-informed and accurately informed. So uh, some of these collaborators are from Columbia. Yu Ding, Yu Jung Jan are both uh, PhD students at Columbia. Uh, Simon Blanchard is a professor at Georgetown. Mira Mirhofer is a PhD student in Vienna. Rachel Meng is a PhD student at Columbia. Uh, Greg Nielassi is a professor at Melbourne. And Verena Schoenmuller is a professor at Bacconi. So it's not just interdisciplinary, it's also cross-national research team. And right now, we're working with computer scientists at Columbia as well, trying to uh, move this program of research uh, forward. Uh, just very philosophically, I've been trying to understand false beliefs for the last 25 years. It was an aspect of my initial dissertation work when I tried to understand how consumers may be deceived by marketers and how this deception can actually be corrected. So starting from that work, I was trying to figure out how do you change people's beliefs? Because we know that our beliefs are sticky. We don't update very easily. So the question is, what can you do to get people to correct these false beliefs? And I think now it has a really urgent and important context to ask that question. So that's what brought me to this topic. Um, just 
just to uh, motivate the research question, not that it needs a lot of motivation. This is some of the popular fake news stories of 2017. Um, you know, as you can see, there's clearly a um, slant to these stories, and the expectation is that people who are motivated or want to believe these stories uh, for whatever reason, because it makes their worldview feel better, makes them feel better about themselves. All of these reasons people may actually uh, believe these kind of, you might say, somewhat absurd stories on the face of it, right? Um, and then here's something about the fact that people themselves are aware that fake news is rising. So the first one is a study that asked adults uh, whether they started reading an article and then realized it was fake. And that's also um, uh, quite high. So 55% of people are being exposed to these stories. If you kind of uh, check yourself and say, wait a minute, and stop reading it, sure, then maybe you're not influenced. Even that we're not sure of, because once you start reading something, you're exposed to it, it's going to influence you. But um, so it's a high number of people who start reading something and then realize that they've been fooled. So it's not just people who are opening themselves up to kinds of fake sources that are getting uh, caught in this web of fake news. It's also people who are just reading stuff they come across and they realize it's fake. Um, also, the uh, in the US, again, people believe 66% think this is a really uh, serious, uh, serious problem. So um, in general, I think we can acknowledge that this is out there and people are concerned about it and we should all be concerned about it. So there's a lot of stories about who's doing it, what their motivations are, why it's happening and so on. Um, the paper I want to start talking about is how this plays out on social media. Because one thing we know is over time, more and more people are getting their news from social media. So even if you're reading the New York Times, you may getting, be reading the New York Times off your Facebook feed, right? You may not actually go to the New York Times uh, website to read it. You might be reading an article from Breitbart, but it's not that you're going to Breitbart to read it. You might be getting it off your social media channels. So the question we started by asking is, there are these two things that are happening. People are getting their news more and more from social media. And at the same time, we're seeing this raise, uh, rise in fake news. And is there something going on such that on social media, people are less prone to kind of reflect and think about uh, the, the, uh, the, the articles they're reading, right? Are they less somewhat vigilant? So that's the first uh, question we asked. So this is basically just data showing that information is mostly social. 80% of Americans say they get at least some of their news from social media. So that's uh, you know, clearly telling us the growth of uh, social media. So I'm going to start with this research paper I just described, which was published last year in PNAS, which talks about um, the fact that people are less likely to fact check news on social media compared to traditional uh, media. So that's the first part of this talk. Why do people believe fake news? And we're going to say it's because of lowered vigilance. People in social media settings feel they're around other people, and therefore they lower their guard, and therefore they're less likely to fact check. So I'm going to show you some studies that are consistent with that account. And then I'm also going to show you some results that speak to the fact that people believe fake news because it confirms what they already think. So motivated reasoning, confirmation bias, call it what you will. So that's the first part of the talk. And then I'm actually interested in trying to uh, apply these uh, insights about why people believe to designing interventions that can help people update their false beliefs, right? So uh, we're going to then um, look at three different studies that look at different ways in which you can get people to change their beliefs. Two of these have been used by Facebook. So part of our motivation is let's see Facebook's trying to flag articles. Facebook is trying to provide you with contrary points of view. And do these things actually work? And if so, like when do they work? Or how can they be better designed in order to be more uh, effective? So that's one set of studies. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, research on people who share fake news. And I want to look at who are people on Twitter. So we actually have a huge database from Twitter looking at what is the profile of people who share. Because another way in which you can kind of um, 
you know, uh, remove the kind of corrosion in, the, in our collective um, information is to remove the source itself. So if we can identify who are these people who uh, share fake news, we can actually, as a platform, try to intervene and read these people's uh, tweets or uh, blogs or posts before they actually share them. Because one of the problems these platforms have is they can't go in and intervene and, uh, you know, kind of screen everybody. This thing, things are happening quickly. There are a lot of people on these platforms. So you need to know who to prioritize. And that's the goal of that third uh, set of studies, which looks at who are these types of people. Okay? And then there's a lot of ongoing work. I'm not going to get into that, but there they're collaborating more broadly with people, as I said, in computer science, trying to understand if you can automate some of these screening uh, algorithms using things like reinforcement learning to uh, figure out which interventions are effective and how to uh, make sure that they're actually uh, creating, um, you know, preventing people from clicking on false links, uh, preventing people from posting, and so on. So that's that last set of things that I definitely will not have time to get into. Let's see how much we get through of the first, uh, first few uh, things. Any questions, thoughts? Should I jump in? Okay. All right. So this is the paper I mentioned on perceived social presence reduces fact checking. So if you want the one liner, the elevator pitch, it's right there. That's exactly what the article shows uh, through a very uh, long drawn out process. I'm going to present to you three experiments, but we have eight in the paper and then we have probably another five in the supplementary materials. But let me just jump into the paradigm that we kind of came across that works really well to illustrate that people actually do fact check less on social media. So here's what we did in the study. Uh, maybe before that, let me tell you why people might, uh, might, um, might fact check less on social media. I talked about this idea of safety in numbers, but maybe quickly let me allude to two, two other potential explanations. One is uh, what might be called social loafing or the bystander effect, meaning that people, when they're in the presence of others, feel they don't need to actually you know, take an effortful action because somebody else will do it, right? So this goes back to like uh, this old urban legend of uh, this woman, Kitty Genovese, who was kind of being attacked on the streets of New York and nobody went to help her. So that inspired this whole stream of research on this bystander effect. So that might be one of the reasons. Another reason could be that you feel people, when you're in a group, you feel it's the polite thing to do to accept what you're being told. So that's kind of a conversational norm. So both these reasons might also be uh, responsible for the lowered fact checking on social social settings. Yeah. So I'm just curious. So like the first thing that came to my mind is when people are in social media, they're there to do a lot of things. Yeah. So distraction. It's almost like distraction. I'm yeah. gonna get to this, I see this, sure. And then the next thing and the next yeah. thing. It's yeah. a, it's a fun yeah. task, but it's a task. Yes. So you want to get everything yeah, through. Absolutely. So, That's yeah. so I think that was also going to be at play. But what we wanted to do is strip away all these other things and say, OK, in its very simple form, just the mere presence of others, what does that do to fact checking? Yeah. Um, OK. So I'll quickly go through the paradigm. All the studies I um, present will be similar. So. Um, the task that was presented to uh, participants is you've got to um, read a bunch of articles and you're going to tell me whether it's true or false or you're going to flag the article, meaning you're going to fact check it. And these articles were always, the headlines were always um, pre-tested to be ambiguous. So it may be true, it may be false. Um, so you, it wasn't very clear what the status of the, art, uh, the headline was. And you logged in, and either you logged in and you were alone, or you logged in and there were names on the side. I'm going to show you that in a few minutes. And uh, they read 36 statements. We tell them it comes from this article, um, this uh, organization called Headlines. And then they uh, rate it true, false, or flag, which is all very nice. But I think the really nice part of this paradigm is the fact that this was actually incentive compatible. So people uh, were uh, rewarded depending on how they did on this task. So they should be really motivated to get it right. So we're really saying, let's take it to an extreme, not distracted, but really motivated. And what we told them is for each correctly identified statement, you learn five cents. For each incorrectly identified cent, uh, statement, you lose five cents. So the true-false judgment is very consequential. Uh, and if you uh, flag, then you neither you know, receive nor lose any money. 
So this was the incentive scheme for study one. Uh, for across the eight studies, we used different incentive schemes where either fact checking cost them money or it was costless. Okay. So this um, is just across all studies again. So when you're alone, this is what you see. Uh, you're playing this game and you're alone. And when you're in the presence of others, you just see the names of anonymous others. It's not friends, it's anonymous others. Okay. And in this first study, we had 103 names on the side. In another study, we reduced that to like 40 names and the number of names doesn't matter. Okay. So um, these statements, as I said, high on ambiguity, 18 of them were actually true, 18 of them were actually false, objectively. Uh, so for example, they would read something like, scientists have officially declared the Great Barrier Reef uh, to be dead, okay? And if you want to know, actually, that is false. <laughs> but uh, they uh, had to answer true, false, or, or, or flag. And uh, you know, they were aware of those um, um, incentive, incentives that they could receive. Okay, so results. So the first, um, the dependent variable here is the number of statements flagged or fact checked out of the 36 statements, okay? So you can see here that when you're alone, you're flagging about six statements. When you're in a group, you're flagging about four statements, okay? So that's the effect in this first study. In another study, what we wanted to do is, okay, let's not show you the names of others like we did in the study. That could be one condition, but let's just, make you think of other people. And one way of making you think of other people is to present the headlines on a um, mock-up of something like Facebook. So that's exactly what we did, is we either presented the headlines like, like we did before, like just headlines traditional, or we kind of incorporated them as a feed on a Facebook-like background. Okay? And then we either had alone or we had a group. So it was a two by two design, either you were alone or in a group, and either you saw it in a traditional format or you saw it in a Facebook-like format. And the hypothesis was, even though you're not seeing people when you're alone in the Facebook condition, just by virtue of being on this Facebook condition, you're gonna start thinking about the presence of other people, and therefore that alone condition on Facebook is going to look like the group condition, and you're gonna see less fact-checking. Okay, so that's uh, the hypothesis. Um, quickly go through the study. You can see here the conditions, headlines, and Facebook, and either the headline was shown like this or it was shown in your Facebook feed, as I just described. Okay, and here's uh, what you see in the results. Again, exactly replicating what we saw before in terms of uh, the traditional headlines. You fact check less when you're in a group setting compared to an alone setting. But on social media, it doesn't, when it's on a Facebook background, it doesn't matter if you're alone or in a group. In both cases, you end up fact checking less. Okay, yeah. What's the performance? Um, Yes, those didn't differ across conditions, the true and false. It was really just the effect on fact-checking, yeah. Um, okay. And then we did another study, uh, this is uh, experiment six in the paper, where we said, okay, is there any interaction with the well-known confirmation bias? So is it the case that people will respond um, in accordance with their prior beliefs, but does that interact with being alone or in a group in any way? So that was the goal of the study. And we used candidates, um, and people read, everyone read statements from candidate A and candidate B. Either the statements were kind of liberal in tone, or the statements were conservative in tone. And uh, we also had um, um, the same conditions of alone versus um, in a group. And we changed the incentive in the study to be minus 0.25 for fact checking, and they didn't get money of like five cents for each correct answer. Instead, their names would be entered on a lottery if they came in the top 10% uh, of the participants. So the incentive scheme was slightly different. So, um, okay. So this is the design uh, alone versus uh, group, same as before. Group size, as I mentioned, doesn't really matter. And then political view of the candidate and the confirmation bias is, confirmation bias is gonna come from the match or mismatch between your political affiliation and the statement. Okay, so um, these were all pre-tested and we created like either liberal or conservative statements. And then here's one result. So here you see the confirmation bias. This chart, it always turns me upside down, so I'm gonna explain it a little bit. So this is the liberal candidate. So let's focus on the top bar here. Um, and the blue is a Democrat and red is Republican. And this is the proportion of responses that are true. 
So you see that Democrats say that more statements are true than Republican if the statement is liberal. And Republicans say more statements are false than Democrats if the statement is, um, sorry, Republicans say more statements are true than Democrats when the statement is conservative. Okay, that's the well-known confirmation bias. You see the same thing flipped around for the false, where Democrats rate the liberal candidate statement as less false than Republicans. Republicans rate the conservative candidate as less false than Democrats. So that's, this part is just the confirmation bias. And you see there's no flagging effects broken up this way. Now I'm gonna show you the results for alone versus group, which is really just replicating what came before. We didn't find any interactions between the match or the political affiliation and the statements and uh, being alone or in a group. So that really didn't matter. But regardless of this confirmation bias, we still replicated the effect we had before, which is that people are fact checking more when they're alone, less when, when they're in a group, regardless of whether it's a small group or a large group. So again, the exact same uh, effect as before. Okay. So this, I think, is a very robust result. We have multiple studies. Uh, but I also do think that sometimes some of these results are driven by the historical context. So if you think about fake news in 2016 versus 2018, I think the kind of zeitgeist has changed because now people are using the fake news term in many different ways. And what we actually find, because we've done some attempts at replication over the years, so we have data from 2017 and 2018, is a difference between Republicans and Democrats. Because Republicans actually have increased their belief that um, the traditional media has a lot of fake news. So when you believe the traditional media has a lot of fake news, that's going to lead you to either rate a lot of things as false or flag things. So we are seeing more effects now on the false, Rolf, to your question, than on the flagging so much. And it's more driven by people's beliefs as to whether the media generally is fake or not fake, which also goes along with political affiliation. So we've been tracking, and it's kind of interesting to see that. And there's another team of researchers, Akshay Rao and others in Minnesota, who are looking at the affiliation of the people on the side. Like we just say these are anonymous others. We don't draw your attention to them in any way. They're just listed on the side. What they did is they actually said these people on the side are either people like you with your political affiliation, or they said they're anonymous. And they actually find a difference so that Republicans are more trusting of news when they're in the presence of other Republicans. Okay, so that's another paper that's uh, something that uh, they followed up on this research. So, uh, so I think uh, what I would say is like, because it's such a topical um, research question, it is something that you're gonna see um, the replications will change over time because they're affected by people's beliefs, right? So in 2016, these are the results we found. For a large, to a large extent, they are replicated even in 2018, but there are all these nuances on differences between Republicans and, and Democrats. So uh, how do you control for this? And I'm gonna talk about how we did it in this paper, and then I'm gonna show you things we are doing uh, to kind of influence um, what can happen in the real world. So in this paper, and I don't see Facebook or anyone doing this, we actually used a prevention um, induction, prevention focus induction, where we use the classic induction, uh, on, which kind of tells people, uh, describe, uh, here's the in induction, how do you describe your duties and obligations, right? Write down what responsibilities you have to meet. This is a psychological classic manipulation to get people to have a prevention focus, which is to be more concerned with uh, safety and to be more, con more vigilant and earnest and so on in their tasks. So we did this uh, manipulation um, in the study to see if it's really vigilance that's driving this and if we can raise vigilance, does the effect go away? So we had a control condition where they recall, did something different, a vigilance condition where they did this duties and obligations recall, and then did, did the exact same task as before. And what we find is our manipulation helps so that the group condition becomes as um, willing to fact check as the alone condition in the vigilance uh, induction uh, condition, right? It's only when in the control condition that we again replicate what we had in the past. So this is great, but I don't think I can go with a straight face to Menlo Park and tell them, hey, you know what, you've got to induce this prevention focus on your Facebook uh, feed, it's not gonna happen. So the question is, what do you do in reality that's more subtle that can be implemented in the real world? So that's kind of what I want to get to next. 
So how to practically use these insights to prevent uh, the spread of fake news? And Facebook themselves have done a few things that they've tried and dropped. And we kind of followed um, on their footsteps, checking out the effectiveness. You know, we are doing these studies. Facebook has access to the real data. They may not be able to ask questions about do you think it's true or false, but they can definitely see are people being engaged? Are they clicking on these articles? They have other measures to see if these interventions are successful or not. Uh, we don't have access to their data. So I'll show you what we're doing. So this is with Yu Jung, who's a PhD student at Columbia and Greg. And uh, we are trying to see does flagging articles in the context of a news page, like if you have lots of flags, does it make you more vigilant in general when you process subsequent information? Okay, so this is what Facebook tried. So they actually had these kinds of dispute flags. Do you remember for a while your feed would have these kinds of disputed by third party fact checkers, that kind of flag. They went to Snopes, uh, PolitiFact, and these out external fact checkers to get this um, information as to whether the article was true or false, and then they would flag it. So this is what they tried. But what they decided is it doesn't really work. Again, they have access to a lot of data, and they um, found that it doesn't work for a few reasons. Firstly, you can't be quick enough in doing the checking. Um, secondly, there's a nuance to these articles. So just saying it's false or true is not enough because it may be somewhat false or somewhat true. So how do you kind of rate something as true or false? So there were a bunch of reasons uh, it didn't work. There were lots of articles that looked at it as well. Uh, this article said uh, use this kind of a flag, rated false, rather than saying disputed because people don't understand what disputed means. So Facebook tried that and then they kind of got rid of that as well. Okay. So, um, and that's for the reasons I mentioned before. They felt, they also said these flags actually draw attention to the article. So maybe people, in fact, uh, are exposed more to the fake stuff because the flags are drawing your attention to it. And there's another very nice paper which shows that when you flag articles, what actually happens is people think the other articles that are not flagged are definitely true. But in reality, Facebook has not had every single article on that shows up checked. Only some of them are checked. So all you should take away from the flag is the one that's disputed is disputed. It says nothing about the other articles. However, people infer that the articles are more true when some articles are flagged and not others. So for all these reasons, they ditched the solution. Uh, but what we wanted to see is, okay, maybe it doesn't work for the article of interest, but does it create a mindset of vigilance? So when you see a lot of things being flagged, do you then think that um, you should be more on your guard and does that then help you uh, process uh, subsequent information? Okay, so this is what we did. We um, um, had a uh, a condition here, the number of disputes, where people saw either few, some, or many disputes in the context, on the page. And uh, then we also manipulated own political affiliation and the article's uh, political tone. And then we asked them, just read it. So these are the three conditions, only one flag on the page, three flags, or lots of flags. So these are the three conditions. So people were assigned to either this condition with low flags, this condition with medium flags, or this condition with high flags, OK? and. Um, Again, this was the task, similar to the previous paper, true, false, or flag, you had points. Um, and then, the, uh, again, between uh, participants, they either saw a science blog, and there were three such science blogs. So this time, we're moving away from headlines to actual articles. And um, after they reviewed the context with few, mid, uh, some, or many flags, they saw these articles. And either they saw a conservative article or a liberal article, which we manipulated the tone of the article and they rated it as true, false, or flag. So three are three such articles, okay? So either it said uh, something like, a majority of Americans oppose off offshore drilling as a means to develop energy resources, or that a majority of Americans uh, approve of offshore drilling, and the article talked about that, right? And these are actually uh, neither strictly true nor false. We had to create two extremes of these articles so that we had the conservative tone and the liberal tone. Okay. So there were three articles like the ones I just showed you. What do we hope to find? We hope to find that people are actually able to overcome their confirmation bias in some way, right? Um, so what we find here is that if, so let me just explain. So the, this is small number of flags on the page, medium number of flags, and high number of flags. And um, so let me see this. Okay, sorry. So uh, here you have, um, 
here what you see is the uh, what I want to draw your attention to. So when there are many flags, yeah, and there's actually a match, that means that the article matches what you believe, you're a liberal and the article is liberal, you actually do make people more skeptical, which is interesting because that's the condition in which you want to change people's beliefs is when there's a match between uh, your belief and the article, that's confirmation bias, motivated reasoning, all of these things would say you should believe that article, but if you're in the context in which there's a lot of flags, it looks like you are going to be more likely to question that article. So there's some evidence that this flagging works. Uh, it works better in this case for uh, Democrats than for Republicans, okay? Um, so uh, basically the conclusion would be that a skepticism inducing media environment, which means one that points out that things could be true or false through flagging or other mechanisms can lead people to question their prior beliefs, yeah? This is for like, they're flagging the beliefs that match with them, right? Like Democrats are flagging. Uh, no, 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 no. So this one uh, in the thing is, we are looking at the false, not flags. The DV, the dependent variable here, is whether they rated it false or not. So did, so, the, did the Democrats also rate the Republican bias headlines as more false? Yes, look here, that's there. So that's showing that they're more false. These are the ones that mismatch. So but actually, the, the results here, but I'm not going to talk about it. It's a bit mixed because I think our articles were not calibrated very well. But on this side, it's pretty good. Like, if they mismatch, you generally think it's false, and the flagging on the contextual page does nothing to change that. But if it matches, then actually, when you have uh, skepticism inducing lots of flags, then you find that you're more likely to say it's false. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so that's... Um, work in progress, it's uh, one finding, and we are still working on uh, trying to see whether you can induce skepticism. You know, yesterday I had a, a talk, um, I gave a talk to the Alumni Association in Hong Kong of Columbia, and one of the questions I got, which I thought was a very good question is, from a business person is, well, why should um, Facebook, any other platform really care about this because it's in their best interest to actually let this all be out there, right? Uh, because then you're going to make more money and advertising. But one, uh, and also what they said is if these flags, uh, if these kinds of interventions are going to hurt in some way, why would they put them up, right? And uh, that's a very good question. I think one of my answers is about the threat of regulation because we know that this is in the public eye. And given that you could be regulated, you're better off coming, off, coming up with your own solutions, right? So uh, this question I just asked actually is, important to the next project, next project I'm going to dis describe, which says that the number of flags not just can have an effect on beliefs, but it can also make you distrust brands that are advertised on the same page. And if that's the case, then it's definitely not in the self-interest of the platforms to use these kinds of interventions. So in this next study that I'm going to describe, it's with uh, Yu Ding, who's a doctoral student at Columbia, and Greg, who is a professor at Melbourne. Um, what we did is, again, a uh, number of disputes, two, uh, in this case it was two versus eight out of ten versus no disputes at all in the context. And uh, then they had to rate brands on uh, trustworthiness and liking. And the brands had been advertised on the page, but then we also measured uh, trustworthiness of brands that were not advertised. So here's what it might look like. So here's an advertisement for GNC. This is a less familiar, pre-tested to be a less familiar brand. And you would see something like this, like this headline, and it would say either it's true or false. Okay? And the number of, uh, that's, sorry. Yeah. And the number of false was manipulated. So either there were two false like this and eight true, or eight false and two true, or there was nothing mentioned here. That's the control condition. And our interest in, nothing was told to subjects about the ads on the page. They were drawn, they were driven, and they were told to focus on the articles and rate these articles. But still, what we find is a spillover effect on these brands. So let me show you the results. So this is what they were told to do. Like they weren't, their attention was absolutely not drawn to the brands on the page. It was just to the articles. And then they rated the brands on trustworthiness and liking. And you know, we just said, let's look at a bunch of brands and uh, what participants were exposed to was either GNC or Nike. Those were the two brands on top. And we said, let's ask the question about a bunch of brands and see what happens. So after they finished the task of rating the headlines, easy to read and so on, they then did this task for all these brands. And we found something really surprising. Um, let me show you the results. 
what we found is it's not the effects of spillover are not only to the brands that are advertised. So here you see all the familiar brands. If you go back to this slide, you see there's a bunch of brands here that are more familiar and a bunch of brands that are less familiar. What we find is for all the familiar brands, right? If there's more false news on the page, like eight false and two true, then they're actually going to trust the brands less. So in some sense, it creates a generalized distrust when you see that in the media context, there's a lot of falsity in the, in the air, so to speak. So it spills over to affect your trust in brands. And this is one finding. We didn't find it to be stronger for the advertised brands like GNC and Nike. Uh, but we are doing more follow-up work because my intuition would be it should be much stronger for the brands that are associated with that uh, false news on the page, right? So uh, this came out actually from someone in uh, an ad agency, J. Walter Thompson, who said and gave us data like from a proprietary data source that shows that trust in brands has been going down over the last 10 years. And it's just, if you look at these big surveys of brand trust, people, just consumers, have been trust, um, reducing their trust in brands. And this happens across product categories and across different kinds of articles. So his question, um, this uh, person at J. Walter Thompson, is why is the brand trust going down? And we started thinking about, could it be the case that this fakeness in the air is also driving down people's trust in brands? OK. All right. Um, so that's that. And the um, third intervention I want to describe to you is this: uh, what would seem to be the most effective, which is just debunking it directly. Tell people, hey, you know what? This is actually false. And this is something that Facebook has also tried. Okay. So here you see uh, they have what's called related articles. So you have an article, and then they present, Facebook will present through an algorithm related articles. And um, this is something that they found was effective. So they actually tried, they, they've been doing this for a while, where they present art, uh, related articles that could either directly debunk the headline or kind of, in some sense, um, provide additional context to that, uh, to that article. Okay. So uh, these are two studies we've done where we're looking at does debunking work? So this kind of related articles idea. Okay. And, um, what we are thinking is, OK, what we would like is that you want articles you already believe in that confirm your prior view. You want those to be uh, subject to the debunking. But just to foreshadow what I'm going to talk about, we actually find the opposite in the study. What we find is people debunking does not work for things that confirm your bias. But they do work for things that disconfirm your bias, meaning if you disbelieve something to begin with, then a debunk will make you disbelieve it even more. Not that that's a bad thing, but you'd really want it to work for the one that confirms your prior views. And we didn't find that. Um, OK. So this is this. Uh, I'm not going to show you the stimuli. You have the pro-Republican and pro-Democratic stimuli. And here are the conditions. So you have, uh, the. it says here, Obama spying on Trump. That's the headline. And then um, in one condition, you have just unrelated things below. In another condition, you have confirming thing, things below, like a source confirms that Obama was spying on Trump. Then you have debunking things below, sources debunk that Obama was spying on Trump. Trump. Or you have one confirming and one debunking. And uh, we want to see, does the debunking, just the debunking alone, this one, does it work regardless of your prior beliefs? OK? Um, all right. So, and the dependent variable was just how accurate is the claim from 1 to 5, false to true. Um, I'll go through this quickly. So you have the participant could be a Republican or a Democrat, and then the statement could be either matching or mismatching. So matching one for a Republican would be a mismatching one for a Democrat. Okay. So let's see what we find. This debunking. So as I started out by saying, if the statement matches your political ideology, these related articles pretty much do nothing. It doesn't matter if they're confirming, if they're disconfirming, if they're mixed. There's no effect. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Extremity. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, 
the extremity of your prior belief is going to matter. So here it's clumped together at Republican and Democrat, but we could look at extremity of the belief here. Yeah? Um, so here we have, uh, and here's the effect that actually works because you can see in the debunking condition, it's lower than the other two conditions where they, if they disbelieve the staff that disagrees with their prior to begin with. But Jenny, to your point, actually, because the beliefs here are greater than the beliefs here, you know that the match mismatch works. You just don't know within each of these how extreme it is. Yeah. Um, so, so you see here that um, the, the debunking works. You, you disbelieve to begin with, but you disbelieve even more if there's a debunk. Okay. Um, there's, I'm not presenting it, but there's like decades of research in psychology which talks about why debiasing does or doesn't work, including like classic research on when you tell jurors to disregard something, they're unable to disregard information. So there's all this work that would suggest that debunking should not work for uh, matching beliefs. But we were curious because we saw that Facebook decided it was a better solution than the flagging solution. So we wanted to see, you know, maybe in this context, it could actually work but it didn't work in the political con uh, context. So I'm gonna skip that. So then we said, let's move to less political statements because there's also issues around science and denial of science that are big for society. It's not only in the political sphere, but also in the sphere of beliefs and science. So we kind of moved away from political and we said, uh, Let's see if debunking could work if it comes from a close other versus someone else. So people like you versus people not like you. And again, a lot of research in marketing consumer behavior shows the social influence effect of the in-group of people who are more like you. So um, that's what we did in this article. So you can see that either uh, in this case, either this article, like a debunk could be liked by other people, like 14 others, or a debunk could be liked by your friend, um, whoever that might be, and others. So this is skewing to you that people like you believe in this debunk, okay? So that's what we tried to kind of mimic in the experiment. Um, so we had a bunch of ambiguous statements, and uh, then we had um, the, uh, the con control condition, then in the confirming condition, this uh, related article confirmed the original article, and it said, uh, that the thumbs up was among people like you, right? Similar to you. And the debunk also, it said, among th thumbs up for this article among people similar to you. And then we had uh, the other conditions, so the two by two, confirm versus debunk among all US readers. Okay, so people like you, people not like you, so similar and not similar, and then uh, confirm versus debunk. All right, so 14 statements and the dependent variable is how many of these were chosen to be false. So it's not a scale anymore, it's how many of 14 statements were chosen to be false. And here you see that regardless of, for these kinds of ambiguous scientific statements, regardless of whether it's people like you or average US readers, the debunking actually works, right? It works, but it's mostly, it's significant here, but if you collapse it, there's a main effect. But you see that what happens is the falsity, a number of statements rated false goes up where they're debunked. Uh, for this context, and it goes up more when the people are similar to you, okay? And then the interesting finding here is some kind of a backfire or boomerang effect. If people who are, um, uh, who are um, not like you, like the average US person, confirm something, there seems to be some kind of a backlash where you disbelieve it even more. Okay, so if, they're, so if you go back to this, this uh, confirming, so if, you, if there's an article here being confirmed by people who are not like you, like the US readers, we actually see an increase in false ratings. Yeah, so that's a backfire kind of effect, which is unexpected. And uh, here is the number of true responses. It just mirrors what you see there. So number of true responses. But what this says to us is that it might be more effective to say people similar to you have um, approved, not approved so much as read or given a thumbs up to the debunking. And when that happens, it actually could be effective. In this case, it's not a strong statement that is uh, confirming your priors because they were more general statements, but we have to check whether using this kind of a social influence effect could help in debunking. All right, so, um, okay. All right, so uh, that's um, 
what I'm, what we are working on in terms of interventions and very much following on the on the feet uh, on the footsteps of Facebook to see okay they are trying this let's see if it's really effective um, and let's see why or why it might not work and I think we have some mixed evidence at this point that um, it could work like some of these things like flagging can raise general vigilance uh, debunking can work if it's done right under some circumstances still very hard to overcome people's entrenched priors. So that's something that I think would be one of our conclusions. So we're still working on that. Yeah. Hi. So I've got a couple of questions sure. related to the political ideology bit. Yeah. So um, have you found any significant differences between the vigilance of Democrats versus Republicans? Because I would imagine that conservatism is more related to, would respond better to like fear, so yes. they be, may be more vigilant. Yeah. But I think in one of the studies, your Democrats came out on top. Yeah, so it's, as I said, there's also this historical element, so things change over time, and definitely some fear mongering has led to more fear among more conser conservative people. A very interesting question, because the next thing I'm gonna show you is people's level of anger and anxiety when they share fake news. So that might speak to that. Um, I, we didn't find in any of the other work so far, I don't know that we measured fear directly, but we, yeah. So it may be the next uh, okay. week. And in one of the earlier studies, uh, you were priming regulatory focus, uh, prevention yes. focus, yes. and you used duties and responsibilities. Yes. Do you think that prime will also prime a conservative mindset because mm. they are related to duties and responsibilities? Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, we didn't check, and we actually just used the well-known uh, prevention manipulation. So we, I don't know if that's also at the same time kind of priming conservatism. Our hope was just to see does it raise vigilance and does it actually do the job of making people fact check, uh, which it did. Um, and then yeah, so I don't, I don't. The answer to that question is I don't know. It could. So all right, this is now a different, like it's a change of pace. Uh, it's kind of uh, work that I'm doing that's kind of using machine learning. It's uh, uh, not a methodology that I've used a lot. So it's something I'm learning as well as we go along. But it's really useful to answer this question of who shares fake news, like what kinds of people share fake news. And if I can profile these people, then again, I can tell Twitter to intervene and prioritize these people for screening. So uh, Verena is actually the genius on all the machine learning stuff. She was a postdoc at Columbia, and that's when we started working on this together. And Simon was visiting Columbia on sabbatical. He's a professor at Georgetown. Um, and what we are saying is it's not just demographics, because there's a lot of research, a lot of anecdotal evidence that the people who share fake news tend to be people who are conservative. They tend to be people who live in like red states. They tend to be people who are angry. So there are some kinds of generalizations. And we wanted to see, can we go beyond just demographics like male and red states and look also at personality and emotions and draw a more complete picture of the types of people who share fake news. Also, this is not just about people who share fake news, because it's also possible that people who share fake news are people who are very avid like social media users, they're heavy users, and they might also share some similarities to people who share any kinds of news. And so what we wanted to do is also compare them to people who share fact check. So taking two opposite ends of the spectrum, let's take fake news sharers and compare them to fact check sharers. So let me tell you how this works. So if there's an article, this uh, I think he was just shut down. This is uh, that Alex Jones site. So let's say there's an article which says um, there's election fraud and Democrats are voting twice in Maryland. Okay, And then sharers, fake news sharers, ironically named truth will prevail or some such thing, uh, takes, <laughs> takes this article and uh, shares it. Right, So that's the fake news sharer. We want to understand more about this person. And then uh, these are the kinds of questions we're going to ask, as I just mentioned. And then what happens is fact check organizations get into the, into the fray and uh, article, a, a fact check or Snopes will say, is this really true or false? Then they come in and they say this is actually false, like the de Democrats weren't voting twice in Maryland. And then you have people who are sharing the fact check, right? So what we want to do is compare the people who shared the fake news and the people who shared the fact check with some other random groups of Twitter users 
we either try to match them in terms of demographics and social media usage, or we try to kind of pick the control groups to be people who are following right-wing publications versus following more uh, liberal publications. So we also have different kinds of control conditions. So I'm not going to get into great detail because I just wanted to give an overview, but let me show you some of our results. Okay. So we have two data sets, so the results here are very robust. In the first data set, what we did is we took, I think, 60 um, articles that Snopes had determined over the period of, I don't know, six months. We took 60 articles that they had determined to be false. And then using those articles, we found people on Twitter who had shared those false articles. And then we found people who had shared the fact check, the Snopes fact check of that article. Okay, so it turns out many more people share the fake article than the fact check article, and that shows up in our data because our sample size for fake news sharers is bigger than a sample size for fact check sharers, about four times as big, I think. So, uh, so that's what we did for the first one. We scraped the data. Uh, when I say we, I should say Verena scraped the data, got all of this uh, uh, done, and she, uh, so that's data set one. Dataset 2 is actually a publicly available uh, website called Hoaxy, where you can actually uh, track fi fake news. It's a, a, wonderful, a wonderful website. And there, um, in the first case, the fake news sharers and the fact check sharers are sharing the same information, like either the false one or the correction of the false one. In the Hoaxy dataset, they're sharing different information. It's just we have a group of people that are sharing fake news, a group of people that are sharing, um, sharing fact check. And then what we do is, we um, get their demographics from their handle, Twitter handle. Uh, we get their geog geography uh, from the Twitter handle, and we use some other mechanisms to get at psychographic profiles. I'll come to that in a minute. So these are the control conditions, the random Twitter users, people who follow mainstream media, or people who, um, sorry, people who follow mainstream conservative or mainstream liberal media. Those are like our control conditions. All right, so this is just quick statistics, how many people we have, um, as I said, about four times as many fake news sharers as fact check sharers because the stories were held constant. And uh, these are ju just a general, uh, a random group of social media users. I think for some, we might also have created them to match the demographics and uh, social media usage and all. And then here we had this other data set which has fake, uh, the different articles, but fake news sharers, fact check sharers, left leaning news media sharers, and right leaning news media sharers. So let me jump to the results. How do we get all this? I talked about users' profile information. Oh, this is really interesting. So we get the uh, demographics in terms of gender and geography from their, hand, from their profile information, but we are able to get their political affiliation by inferring that if you're following Hillary Clinton, you're likely to be a Democrat. If you're fo following GOP, Donald Trump, you're likely to uh, be a Republican. So we use that uh, followership to infer political affiliation. And then uh, social media usage behavior we can easily get because we know the number of tweets and what, you know, the activity, basically. Uh, emotions, we use Luke. So this is a dictionary that uh, does text mining. So you can actually uh, go through all the tweets of the fake news sharers, fact check sharers, control, con control group, and look at what words are they using. And certain words are marked as being words that are related with, let's say, anger, anxiety, uh, negative emotions, sadness, and so on. And uh, that's what we did to kind of get to their emotions. And then in terms of personality, we used a published paper that had a methodology to actually infer uh, personality. So we used their uh, API to actually get to personality, big five personality traits. Um, okay, let me show you some results. So the first thing is uh, all our results um, are robust across both the samples, which was very reassuring. So regardless of how you pick the fake news sharers, regardless of the particular fake news, the profiles seem very um, similar. And uh, we, re we uh, replicate this general finding that fake news sharers tend to be more male compared to other groups. And in fact, fact checkers tend to be more female compared to other groups. Okay. Um, we also find, uh, co consistent with prior work, that fake news sharers tend to be more conservative and fact check sharers tend to be more liberal based on the other accounts they're following. Okay. And then uh, we find that they're heavy users of social media. Both groups are heavy users compared to a random control condition. Emotions. So here's something that we found actually very interesting. 
um, I think it speaks to your point about fear. This is about anxiety and anger. So what we find is, so in Luke, the way this works is if it's 0.99, it means 0.99, like almost 1% of the words reflected this emotion. It may seem low, but in a big, uh, in, a, in a tweet of, you know, it's, it's quite significant. When you see it, I think even human raters would call that an angry, angry tone. So, um, so this is um, the fake news sharers have more anger compared to the average social media users. And they're also more anxious compared to the average social media users, okay? Which is interesting. But what we found really interesting is this is exactly the same between fake news sharers and fact checkers. Okay, so they're both equally angry and both equally anxious. So the source of anger and anxiety might be different, but as reflected in their tweets, they're both equally angry and equally um, anxious. And then we also looked at what uh, Luke, this dictionary calls negative emotions, and we found that uh, fake news sharers have more negative emotions than average social media users, uh, but the same negative emotions as fact check users. So the negative emotions goes beyond anger and anxiety. It includes sadness, includes a bunch of other things, which uh, Luke is it's not very clear what else it includes. Um, okay. So the results of the second sample are exactly in line with these findings on anger and anxiety, negative emotions, sadness, and so on. Um, and then these high arousal emotions seem to be higher for people who are sharing fake news and fact checks. Uh, so these motivations we can kind of infer are similar for both groups. They're motivated to share because they're angry and because they're anxious, okay? Um, which kind of suggests are there interventions that one can do to reduce anger on the platform? Like what can one do to reduce anger and anxiety so people don't just click and hit share with every piece of news that they kind of agitates them, right? Um, okay. We also find um, some interesting results on religion. So fake news sharers um, use more words associated with God and church, temple, altar, all of those kinds of words compared to fact check sharers, more religious, and more concerned with uh, death, like uh, existential concerns. Uh, this religion thing is very interesting because my colleague uh, Oded Netzer has done some research trying to figure out um, um, with, he looks at this platform called Prosper, which is a loan platform, peer-to-peer -peer lending. And he looked at uh, the, uh, you know, when you ask for a loan, you have to write something about what you're asking for the loan for. So he text mined those, he and a doctoral student at Columbia, Allen, they text mined those requests for a loan and found that people who default, who tend to default on the loans, are more likely to have religious words in their, in their ask. Okay, so this is uh, just a descriptive finding. There could be many reasons for this, uh, but uh, it's also uh, kind of interesting that the people who default tend to have more religious words. I'm not saying anything about whether they are more religious or not, but they tend to have more religious words in their text. Similarly, the fake news sharers tend to have more religious uh, words in their tweets. Um, personality, um, we find uh, some interesting uh, interesting results. So fake news uh, sharers and uh, average social media users are equally conscientious, but fake news sharers are less agreeable than the others, than the, the uh, social media users, and uh, a little more uh, neurotic in terms of the big five uh, personality. And then here you look at the fake news sharers and fact check sharers, they're equally conscientious. Um, interestingly, this is unexpected. We found um, it's not a huge effect, but these samples are big. But fact check sharers are not more agreeable than fake news sharers. In fact, they're somewhat similar, a little lower. And then in terms of neuroticism, actually, the fact check sharers are equally neurotic, in fact, a little more neurotic than the, uh, than the fake news sharers. Okay, so that's all very interesting and great for cocktail party conversation, but the question is, what can you do with this? And what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to predict who is a fake news sharer by using either demographics or emotions or personality. Yeah. Yes, uh, so Verena has done that, and I think the in terms of number of followers, I think that was one of the things we used to say whether they're a heavy user or not. I think, I'm not 100% sure, but she had a number of tweets, she had a number of things that went into whether they're heavy users. I have to look specifically at number of followers. Uh, but I know we did, we did look at that. I don't have the results off the top of my head. Yeah, what I highlighted were things that 
were different. So my guess would be it's not different, but I can go back and look. Okay. All right. So the next thing, so then how do we use this? And that's where we want to get into prediction. And we want to say like, okay, can I go to Twitter and say, if you're going to screen some of your, um, some of your users, these are the kinds of people you should be screening. And so far, all we know is that you should be screening males who maybe are in the red states, and we don't really know very much more than that. Also, another interesting thing is, on Twitter, it's not always easy to get demographics because people don't always post. We used actually a, a tool that takes the name of the user and gives you a gender, whether it's, a, and then we had to get only, we used only people who are identified as male or female. Um, but that's obviously hard to do, yeah. So I keep, I keep, uh, and maybe that's my own narrowness, uh, is that I have Facebook, but I don't have Twitter. Because um, it's enough uh, to just be able to work and not have it. So I wonder, because there must be research on this already, whether Twitter or a certain kind of person, related to his point, you really want followers. You know, you're trying to build up a big, big fan club. and. Facebook would be more broadly, be a different kind of person with that. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a huge overlap. Um, I, I'm not an active Twitter user or Facebook user, so I'm doing the research, but I don't really, I'm not into social media in a big way. But I think there's a huge overlap. But I don't think it should matter in terms of the emotions that drive you to share, right? It's going to be similar personality and emotions whether you're on Facebook or Twitter, I would, I would think. No, there's a different kind of person. Though. Yeah, but who shares is still going to be similar, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there's a huge overlap, actually. How many people, let's get a quick poll here. How many people have both Facebook and Twitter? Huh, not a huge overlap. Maybe a lot of people here on social media. Uh, we had like six people out of, I guess, 25, yeah. Uh, but I think there are statistics that uh, we should look at. Look at that. Good question. Um, okay, so let's look at predicting fake news sharers. And what's really interesting here, and what I really like, is that demographics alone can predict fake you, uh, fake uh, fake sharers. Actually, fa fake news sharers. It should be 59% accuracy. The loop, which is the emotions can predict at 77% accuracy. So looking at the emotions as reflected in the tweets greatly increases the predictive power of uh, uh, your fake news sharers. Personality alone is 61%. Demographics with the Luke, with the emotions is 75%. So adding demographics to the emotions doesn't help a lot. Demographics and personality not great either. So I think what's really nice and maybe actionable, actionable is this notion that you can use emotions to, in the tweets, as reflected in the tweets, publicly information, available information, to then say, okay, these are the people we should be screening and making sure they're not spreading uh, fake news, right? And it's interesting because this is uh, just the ones I showed you on anger and anxiety, fake news sharers and fact checkers are similar, but when we do these predictions, we use all of the emotions. We're not just using um, anger and anxiety. If we used only anger and anxiety, I think it would be hard to differentiate between the fake news sharers and the fact checkers. All right. So, um, just broad conclusion on who shares, they're both uh, f fact news, uh, fact check sharers, fake news sharers are very active on social media. Uh, fake news sharers more conservative, fact checkers more liberal, uh, males versus females, I said that before. And then these underlying motivations of forces, and I think there's a lot of room for more work on this, like what makes people share? And it's related to the work in marketing on what makes things go viral, right? So you can think about that as being kind of uh, some uh, basis for these findings. Um, so like highly emotional things are more likely to be shared, like, you know. Um, so, 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 one, so I think the finding that fake news sharers and fact checkers are similar on those emotions is an interesting and unexpected one. And uh, we can also use the differences between these groups to then predict uh, who's likely to share and who's not, right? So which is uh, the idea that these emotions as revealed through this Luke analysis can actually help us uh, predict fake uh, news sharers with a high percent. Um, accuracy. All right. So um, just to quickly um, summarize and wrap up what I've talked about, uh, I started with this finding that people are less vigilant on uh, social media in the, or when they're in the presence of others because they feel the safety in numbers heuristic. And uh, 
starting with that point, we then wanted to say, if you feel less vigilant, what are things that one can do to make you feel more vigilant. And that's where we use some of these interventions. I've talked about uh, flagging versus debunking, and we're looking at under what conditions do each of these interventions work. And then in terms of um, the emotions aspect, I want to do a lot more to try to understand the role of anger and anxiety and how to go in and intervene to prevent uh, anger and anxiety on these sides or to reduce the uh, the temperature, right, when, so that you're not sharing as much. Um, just to quickly uh, talk about some other news, uh, other ongoing work um, that we're doing is this idea of harbingers of fake news came from the paper by Duncan Simester and some of his colleagues. Uh, I think it was Eric Anderson, Duncan Simester, and someone else. It's a marketing paper that looks at there are certain kinds of people who are harbingers of new product failure. And if these people adopt new products, we know that they, uh, these products are going to fail. So in that idea is you can identify these harbingers of new product failure. So we want to kind of uh, get on that, um, uh, use that methodology to say, can we identify harbingers of fake news? And once we identify these harbingers of fake news, can we use some kind of um, reinforcement learning methods to get them to um, kind of uh, to prevent them from, uh, you know, like you would kind of elevate for the platform these people and these people's profiles, and also you could do interventions that are more automated using computer, computerized algorithms. Um, and then something else that we are doing is, how can you train people to be more skeptical, right? And how do you get people to, to create, to have a vigilant mindset? And we're trying out some interventions uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. Okay, so that's all I have, and I'll take questions, thank you. So, I see that both fake news sharers and fact check sharers tend to be more anxious, angry, and heavy users. So, I was thinking maybe these emotions are brought by the fact that they are heavy users rather mm -hmm. than by what they're sharing. Interesting. And there could be but maybe some other personality or individual characteristics that drive how much people use social media. Mm -hmm. And that might then move them to either of these two parts. Yeah, so you're saying the very fact of being obsessive about social media could make you anger, angry and anxious, yeah. Yeah, interesting. The, uh, we do have like control conditions who are heavy users who don't share, and they are different. So, so I think you, we can kind of rule out that reverse causality, that if you're a heavy user, you become more angry and anxious because of these other conditions we have. So we have people who are matched on usage who don't share, but they're different on other dimensions. So it's not the usage making them share. Although your, your intuition is right because there's research showing that heavy users of Facebook, for example, have lowered self-esteem uh, and maybe ang higher anger because then you're setting yourself up against this unrealistic comparison standard. Yeah, thinking about something like that, maybe some kind of interaction yeah. between you and personality yeah. might help disentangle the differences. Yeah, good, good point. Yeah. Have you done any uh, studies about um, the structure of uh, fake news? I mean, um, um, fake news usually have <coughs> some kind of forms or yeah. categories. Yeah. And this is my first question. The second question is that um, I've read the abstract of this talk, and there's um, one keyword that um, attracted my attention is um, is uh, is advertising. Um, advertising maximizing or yes, effectiveness. <coughs> no, no, no. I mean, um, 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 advertising um, message. Yeah. Um, um, they used to um, 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 produce to the edge of the truth, so that um, once you are not careful about it, you will fall into the trap of untruthfulness. Uh -huh. And um, have you studied this kind of information? Yeah, so I have not looked at structure of fake news, but there's a lot of ongoing research on that where people are looking at the content of fake news itself. But I personally have not looked at that. And in terms of the edge of truthiness, I'm not sure I understand the question. Oh, advertising optimized information. Oh, okay. No, that's just the idea that the reason that we see a lot of fake news is because everyone's trying to create content that will then, um, you know, uh, get a lot of clicks, which then leads to advertisers, therefore, 
putting ads on your site because it's being viewed a lot and getting a lot of clicks. So that's, that's, that's the way the whole platforms work. And that was just saying that as a result, that is the motivation for people. In fact, there was a really revealing article in the New York Times a couple of days ago about this guy who's, who is the sole produ largest producer of fake news. He's a guy sitting in Maine. His motivation initially, I think, was just to make money. But he's a liberal Democrat who's dreaming up the most absurd right-wing conspiracy theories and posting them so that it will then attract um, advertising. It's like clickbait, basically. Um, but but this guy um, actually claims that he then takes people who click on his uh, fake news and then holds them up and gets them to delete their accounts and those kinds of things. So some kind of a vigilante who's using the methods of the opposition. Yeah, so it's kind of an interesting uh, point, but that's kind of why people do it. It's because it helps them uh, with, uh, make money. So, I mean, that's the, I would say, the one group of actors. And then there's obviously the malicious actors who are doing it for reasons of actually changing election outcomes and other things. The last part, okay, thank you for the talk. So uh, my question is, now we, nowadays we keep emphasizing critical thinking. Yes. And we, te we teach students, we yes. also, you know, it's very important. But obviously we see the trend, right? More and more people, they easily just accept the, the fake news and they spread so common. So as educators, what are we yeah. supposed to do? So if we see some okay, fake news, should we just debunk? Or we just ignore. Yeah, so it's a it's it's a good question, but I think I'm not as pessimistic because we did see in the beginning statistics that show that more and more people are now wary of it and that they stop reading when they realize it's fake news. Uh, the other part of it, whether people continue to believe things they've already believed, which may be untrue, that's a huge psychological problem. But your question on what can educators do, it's it's a very good question, and you know, getting so there's. Um, People who are trying to say, can we get people educated on the difference between fact and opinion, for example? And how do you create this differentiation between fact and opinion? And um, they start this in schools where they're trying to educate kids to differentiate fact from opinion. And the Pew Research Center has a really nice um, quiz that they do. And then they summarize the results across all Americans. And that is very informative because what they do is they have 10 articles, the headlines, and they ask you, is this um, uh, fact or opinion? And their definition of fact is not that it's true. The definition of fact is, is it verifiable? So that a factual statement is one that's verifiable, regardless of its truth. And uh, um, uh, opinion is something that's not verifiable. So they kind of define the fact and opinion this way. And then they have people take the quiz. You go to the website, you take the quiz, you get a score. And then they give, um, they update the scores across all people. And I say, I think the, the results are a good news, bad news thing. So people aren't great at this task, but they're not as bad as you might think. But also they are prone to this confirmation bias because they break down the results by Democrat, Republican, and you see that uh, people think that opinion is fact if it agrees with their priors. So I have a question about the social presence online. So in your research, they're all about like some background like presence. They're not like sharing anything. They're just being there. You look at there are multiple people yeah. probably on the same page as you are. But when people, I think when people are like actively sharing something and you see a lot of people are sharing the same piece of information, yeah. actually you can become more skeptical, uh -huh. especially nowadays. So is it like a critical thing whether mm. it's, a, it's an active participation or more like a passive presence? Yeah, I mean, in our case, it's only mere presence of others. But I think to your point, the, uh, the other study where we look at if it's uh, you know, liked or disliked by people like you, and we have a great number of shares, it suggests that if it's people like you, then you kind of go along with them rather than you go against them, which is what your theory, your, your hypothesis is. But I think it's an interesting question, like when would you like kind of have a backfire to people actually, too many people liking something, right? Is that a signal that that's something that must be false, right? Which is uh, interesting. So it'd be nice to identify conditions under which there's a backfire effect to a lot of people sharing information. And, and a second question is, do you think people are kind of learning now, like they see more and more fake news, and they see the news that people share the most can turn out to be the false news yeah. at the end of the day. Do you think they can learn, like, yeah. maybe 10 years from now, then people actually become more skeptical yeah. on social network yeah. than 
actually in real world. Yeah, so I mean like the, uh, so what you're saying is another thing, like the number of flags can make people skeptical, but what you're saying is just having a high number of shares should increase your vigilance because there's something fishy if this is being shared so much, right? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, another question is if that's the case, then how can you kind of uh, incorporate that into designing things in a way that make people more, I mean, rather than just relying on the fact that some things tend to be shared a lot and they tend to be fake, is there a way you can incorporate that insight into designing a platform to make people more more skeptical, right? Yeah, but it's a very good point, yeah. I yeah. have another, so kind of more reflection maybe than a question. So I think that for most people, especially probably for the American context, the political side is more interesting. But I guess it's also not fuzzy because, like as as you mentioned, like it's not easy to disentangle what is true and what is false. Like maybe scientific realms would be yeah. a better starting point yeah. to figure out people's opinions. But I mean, given that the political and I'm thinking about the political situation in my home country, in Italy is particularly prone to this topic right now, unfortunately. And, Which and is I'm from Italy. Italy, from Italy. Italy. And I'm thinking that going beyond actually like news and articles, like could that also be applied to like what politicians say, like going back to the source now? Yeah. Because like where does that fakeness come from? Like for Donald Trump or a lot of like other politicians around the world, a lot of them it's like themselves who spread this news that might not be completely fake but are not factual or are not truthful in a way. So yeah. I think it, it would also be interesting to try and go even one step further towards the source yeah. and trying to understand what we can do to make people fact check or yeah. demand better the actual statements. Yeah, so there is a movement, I don't know how far that's gotten, to actually say, okay, let's abstract away from statements and fact checks of statements to actually giving a score to sources. Yeah, but then there are like the sources can be like the well-known, like the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Guardian, La Scala, whatever. But uh, you have also this uh, uh, sources are people as well. So how how I mean, even if you did do this kind of uh, scoring, you can't do it uniformly. Maybe you can do it for people in the public sphere, like politicians or others. Uh, yeah, some people would be off the charts. <laughs> Not sure what you do with that. Also, given that people have the confirmation bias, right? But there is a movement to kind of say, let's look at the sources and try to kind of tag sources with the honesty or tr trustworthiness. Yeah, because like honesty has been one of the main like propaganda models of one of the parties that is now in power. And mm -hmm. like people who believe now, even when like those people in from the party say something that is evidently false or not truthful, like the supporters are anyway, yes, but but that's like they're honest and yeah. like that's what they say, so it must be true. So, yeah. so kind of creating a kind of... Uh, they create the narrative that they're saying these things, they might seem absurd, but that's because they call it as it is kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So there's uh, actually to the point, there's some research that other people are looking at where if you provide a narrative, so it's like things that get believed are things that have a causal explanation. And so when you try to debunk it, you also need to provide a causal explanation. And there's some work along those lines as well. But then repeating it and then providing the causal explanation just reinforces the original. So the question is, how do you create, like you're constantly on the defensive because you have to create a counter narrative without reinforcing the initial narrative, yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>